This video is intended to be a comprehensive and meticulously detailed resource to provide you the information you need to fully inform your purchasing decisions, whether that be with TLB Mallorca or any other shoe company. This video serves three primary purposes. Number one, to introduce you to TLB Mallorca and their products in case you are not already aware of them. Number two, to give you all the information you need to know about them to make the most informed decision with your money. If you are looking for the one singular video that will cover literally everything you need to know, welcome, you have arrived, this is that video. And lastly, number three, to help you better understand how to assess the quality of shoes in general. I may make a video specifically about this in the future. However, this will still serve as a great resource to help you understand what to look for in the finer details when evaluating a shoe and what questions you may want to ask the maker. Even if you're not particularly interested in TLB Mallorca, you will nonetheless walk away with a heightened skill set and knowledge to better navigate the realm of high quality stitched leather footwear. In this video, I will first discuss the history of TLB Mallorca, then I will start off by by talking about the packaging and then open it up to reveal the shoe and explain why I chose that particular model. I'll go over every single detail of construction and materials and then highlight the notable design elements and design choices of the shoe. However, these shoes do not merely exist in a void but instead a market full of other shoes. So to get a better idea of the value of the product, I'll be comparing them to the similarly priced and almost identically designed Allen Edmonds Park Avenue. Then I will make note of any imperfections, manufacturing defects, and design flaws with the shoe. Then I will cover more peripheral concerns such as the website, other products, and custom made to order program that TLB Mallorca offers, as well as their client service experience. Then we'll shine them up and see how they look. But make no mistake, this is not a review of TLB Mallorca in that we are here to discover whether or not they are good shoes. These are decidedly, in my opinion, the best value for mid-tier Goodyear welted leather footwear on the market and by a significant margin. Starting off with company history, there's actually not much here because this company was just started in 2017 by Antonio Yobera Barcelo, who initially learned leather craft from his father and grandfather who worked in the trade. After working for a previous company and feeling dismayed that the standard of quality and excellence that he strove for could not be achieved there, Mr. Yobera decided to open a company of his own. Offering a wide variety of shoes, boots, and belts, TLB Mallorca manufactures its products entirely on the island of Mallorca and in its own factory. And I want to emphasize that point because I think that's much less common than people typically think. And it is a large part of why they can produce such a special product. It's having that direct control over the manufacturing process. Since its inception just six years ago, TLB Mallorca has carved out one of the most respected positions in the international shoe market for its notable exceptional value being featured on the likes of GQ, Fashion Press, and here. To settle for nothing but the highest standards of excellence is the philosophy on which TLB Mallorca has been forged. Let's find out why. Starting with the packaging. Okay. This comes in a dark gray box. It's very nicely manufactured. It has this sort of coarse fabric texture to it. and give you a little... It's very clean, it's very well done. It has a silver logo on the top of the box and then also on the end of the lid. And then you have the label very nicely put on here that just has basic information about the product. The box is in very good condition. There's only just very minimal, a little bit of factory dust, the stickers in place. Packaging is very important to me. I think it says a lot about the intent of the maker. It kind of tells you that they're not just concerned about the shoe. They're really thinking about how do I make for the best entire client service experience. Opening up the box, we've got just a basic tissue paper. It's nice and layered over the shoes. Here you can see you've got the shoes in the shoe bags and you've got two blocks of tissue paper here just to help provide a little more cushioning. Typically I prefer a little more cushioning like some foam pads in here, but it did work fine, so can't really complain. Something to keep in mind when we are talking about packaging is that we have to frame the whole discussion within the realm of reasonable cost, right? This whole product would be much better if this box was made of gold, but I also don't really wanna pay for a box made of gold, right? So we have to be reasonable about what the product costs and what you could expect from the packaging. One note I wanna make is the tissue paper is this black gray color 
which it could be anything. It could have been brown, it could have been white, it could have been just whatever was laying around. But the owner of the company took the time to make sure the tissue paper matched the color of the box, matched the color of the shoe bags. So here, opening it up, we've got the right shoe. And then oof, the left shoe. Before moving on to the shoe, I wanna make one last note on the shoe bags themselves. You can see these are just a basic black cotton, which is perfectly fine, drawstring. They do come in two shoe bags, which is always preferable over the one connected shoe bag, which is a little bit unwieldy, so you always like to have two separate ones. What I really like about these is that these have the logo on it. And the printing is nice. It's got a sort of silver, glittery quality to it. But more importantly, having a logo really helps because when I'm wearing my shoes and maybe it's kind of a rainy day or they get a little mucked up, when you put the shoe in the bag, you have this dirty sole on one side of the shoe. I don't want to then take the shoe out and wear it again and bring it back and then, you know, the bag's unlabeled, so I flip it over by accident. And now you have this kind of dirtier part of the bag that was touching the sole, now touching the upper of the shoe. Having a bag with some kind of label on it is just an important touch to the overall client experience. Those kinds of decisions that are functional and sensible are easy to overlook. Really strong first impression. Let's talk about the shoe and why I chose it. So this is the 198 Artista. It comes on the Van Gogh last in black box calf. This retails for about $400 with free shipping, free size exchanges, and free sizing guidance. The reason I chose this particular model is threefold. Number one, I wanted a very simple design. You know, TLB Mallorca is known for having a very wide variety of options, and we'll discuss those more later. I wanted to highlight what makes these products special across all of them. And that is really the fundamental kind of basics of design and construction. And there's really no better way to look at those kinds of things than by choosing a very simple model. The second reason is that I wanted a model that would reflect exactly what you guys would get if you ordered it right now. There's no special features to the shoe. There's no JR soles, there's no toe taps, there's nothing like that. I was very specific with the owner of the company in our emails that I wanted a product that was exactly like if someone just ordered it from the website coming from the factory. No special treatment. The third reason is that later on we'll be comparing this to the Allen Edmonds Park Avenue. I felt it would be most helpful to choose an almost identical model to really give you guys an idea of what you can get on the market for $400. So let's start with construction and materials. What are you physically getting with this product and how do each of those components compare to what you would typically see on the market at this price point? We will start with the exterior materials and then move more towards the interior. And keep in mind, qualities like stitch density and sole finishing will be saved for the next section when we discuss design. To start off, this is a Goodyear welted shoe. I'm not going to get into the nitty gritty of construction, but the important point to make is that fundamentally there are two parts of the shoe. There's kind of the top half, the upper, and then the lower half, which is the sole and the heel block. You need to attach those two components to each other. And the way in which you do that is typically what we refer to when we talk about the construction of the shoe. In the Goodyear welting process, you use a welt, which is a thin strip of leather to which the upper and the insole is stitched. And then the outsole is separately stitched. So you have the upper is attached to the welt, and the welt is attached to the outsole, and that connects the whole shoe together. There are a variety of benefits to this, two primary ones being that it is more waterproof than some other types of construction like Blake, and also that it allows the shoe to be resold, which means if you wear through the bottom of the shoe, which will happen much faster than the top, you can have that sole replaced pretty easily. The last note I'll make is that this is perfectly standard at this price point. Usually for $400, you should expect a shoe that is Goodyear welted or some equivalent or variation of that. The second note on construction is that this uses gemming. Again, gemming is really something that deserves its own video and I'll probably make one in the future. I just bring it up for those who are concerned. Gemming describes how the welt is attached to the insole and upper, and the only thing you really need to know is that that is perfectly acceptable at this price point. Okay, moving on to the materials now. Bonus points to whoever can guess what this is. This shoe has flat 
laces. That's what comes with the model. I personally really like flat laces. Flat laces have historically been looked down on a little bit because of their association with sneakers. However, I think if they're done well, they look perfectly fine. So much time and work is put into this line right here, the actual last of the shoe, that I don't really want anything to be disturbing that. I want the laces to hug flat against it. And to me, round laces, they just sort of pop out from it and disturb that line in a way that I just don't think necessarily flatters the shoe. A lot of what we do in this realm of classic menswear, a lot of the things we wear, suits and these nice shoes and trousers and so on, they're really difficult to maintain, like sometimes almost unnecessarily so. But that's part of what makes them so special when they're done well, when you have a tie with a proper dimple, when all these things are clean and orderly. I think flat laces really add to that because flat laces are very easy to mess up. It's very easy when you're lacing them for it to rotate over. It's super noticeable, it doesn't look very good. Flat laces really help communicate your competence. You know, when they're all laying flat, very cleanly, kind of tells you about that person and their attention to detail to caring and maintaining for their wardrobe items and kind of their skill at doing so. It's just one of those extra little things that elevate your outfit and elevate what you communicate to others about your outfit and about yourself. And these are blended cotton, so they're not entirely synthetic, they're not entirely natural, which would be ideal, they are blended. And that is, again, perfectly normal at this price point. Next, moving on to the upper leather. This comes from Anna which is a tannery in France. It's a highly reputable tannery known for putting out some of the best leather in the world. This is really, clean leather. I mean, I go over these shoes with like a microscopic level of detail in preparation for these videos, and I cannot find a single blemish at all. And usually I can, even on shoes that are far more expensive, which is often still perfectly acceptable. Mr. Yobera is not kidding when he writes on his website that they choose nothing but the absolute best pieces of leather. Really impressive. Moving down to the bottom of the shoe, we have the outsole. This is, again, just a very standard piece of vegetable tanned leather. We'll talk more about the finishing later on. Down to the heel block, you have the top lift, which is this bottom layer here. This is a combination heel, which refers to that half rubber, half leather. The reason for that is because leather shoes in general, but especially when they're new, can be very, very slippery. Carpet, vinyl plank, marble, ballroom, kind of any flooring at all. So this extra layer of rubber just helps provide a little more traction. And of course you could have it entirely rubber, but having the half leather bit is a sign of quality and craftsmanship. Additionally on the bottom, you can see these heel nails here. They do help hold the shoe together, but primarily they're for decoration. They're brass nails, just adds a little decorative touch to the shoe. Now moving back up the shoe, you've got the heel stack layers here. They are fairly even and fairly well done. In the heel block of quality shoes, you will typically see one of two materials. One is leatherboard and the other is leather. Leatherboard is to leather what particle board is to wood. It is a variety of ground up leathers that are shredded to bits and then bound together using an adhesive to form a leather-like material that is less expensive while still being somewhat functional for the purpose of using leather. Now, leatherboard will warp more easily, it will crumble and deteriorate more easily, so it is inferior for a heel stack. And while only slightly so, it is these subtle material choices that distinguish high quality shoes from everything else. These use real leather, which you would not really expect at this price point. You would fully expect leatherboard. That already is a really good sign and is another key as we sort of unveil the story here of this being quite a well-made shoe. Moving back up the shoe, we have the welt. This is a 360 degree welt. Sometimes it can be 270. It's 360, totally normal for this price point. And then moving into the shoe, we'll talk about these later. You have the insole, which is full leather. Sometimes that can be leatherboard or fiberboard or even some kind of synthetic foam material. Being real leather, this will just to help mold to your foot over time and make for a more comfortable fit as you slowly break into the shoe over days, weeks, months, years. Then you have the upper lining calfskin from NNA. 
as well as the sock liner here. Now the sock liner primarily provides a little bit of extra cushion for your heel. And you'll notice that it only extends halfway up into the shoe. And if you're anything like me, you may have thought that seemed kind of incomplete and perhaps it was a material cost decision to not extend this all the way to the front of the shoe. But actually it's a very specifically intentional decision for two primary reasons. One is you don't actually want that sock liner to extend up because if it does, it adds another layer of insulation to the shoe, which will make the shoe less breathable and more prone to inducing sweating. And the second reason, which perhaps is more important, a lot of times these companies will hide what's underneath the shoe using that sock liner. Maybe they use a cheap fiberboard or cheap synthetic insole and they don't want people to see that so they use this thin little sock liner to hide it all. This is the company saying, look, you can see our whole product because we're proud of what we put in it. This is a real leather insole. So that's a really good sign. Often you'll see this in like hand welted shoes or higher grade bespoke shoes. You can see the actual craftsmanship, the workmanship inside the shoe. It's not necessarily too much about the value as much as it is a sign of the intent of the maker, the transparency, the honesty, saying, hey, I produce a beautiful product. I have nothing to hide. So we really like to see that in a quality shoe. And now we're gonna to move to the interior non-visible components of the shoe. Starting with the heel counter, the heel counter is a piece of material that stretches around the heel. It goes in between the upper and the lining. So it's basically sandwiched in there. It provides a little more structure to the shoe as well as molding to your foot over time. And now let me introduce a third material, which is the sort of bottom rung of the ladder, which is Celastic. Celastic is a synthetic material made from plastic and fiber. It serves a similar function of being able to mold to one's foot and bend and provide a little bit of structure. And while there are different grades of Celastic, in general, it will be worse at all of these things than leatherboard, but then also cheaper. At this price point, you would expect to see leatherboard and you probably wouldn't expect to see leather for like another few hundred dollars going up the ladder in price. This uses leather, which is pretty incredible. And the leather has a few benefits because if this heel gets crushed, you accidentally come down on it with your foot or you drop the shoe, Celastic and leatherboard will just break. It is totally irreparable. You basically just need to buy new shoes. Leather, you can actually go in cut open the shoe, reform the leather, re-stiffen it, seal it back up and repair it as well as it will better form your foot over time. It'll take a little longer to break in compared to leatherboard, but you will get a much better fit over the years. It is an impressive quality of craftsmanship to have leather in the shoe. It's, it's in some ways kind of unreasonable. Uh, which is what makes this shoe so special. Now moving around to the toe stiffener, which is a similar piece of material, which is sandwiched between the lining and the upper of the shoe to provide extra structure and stiffness, which will help support the complexity of the last at this point of the shoe, as well as your mirror shine. This is really important. I do not want to understate this. The difference between using Celastic and leatherboard is arguably completely marginal. I mean, really, really small. Most people who buy this shoe will never know and probably never care even if they found out. There is no reason from what you would consider a profit-focused business standpoint to use leatherboard in this shoe. Mr. Yobera has chosen to use leatherboard in this shoe for the toe stiffener. That choice should tell you a lot about this company. And it's something that to me, I will spend probably more time talking about than anyone is even interested in hearing because to me, that is indicative of good business. You know, people say like, oh, Christopher is passionate about shoes. It's like, I'm passionate about good, honest, transparent business done by people who care about their clients, they care about you, they care about providing an exceptional product. And it is only in these decisions that no one will ever know about, no one will ever care about, that you can see that intent. It's so important. I know it's a long video and people are gonna say that I'm ranting on this point, but like I cannot make this without highlighting this point because a big part of this series, a big part of me making the channel is about highlighting these sort of makers that really care about the client. And there are shoemakers and cobblers out there who will say, 
it doesn't matter. The client will never know. They'll never know if it's leatherboard. They'll never know if it's elastic, you know, heel counter. No one will ever know. And they're right. But that is why it's so important. That is why these decisions are so important to assess. They tell us a lot about how much you can trust the company and whether or not you really want to support them. Do you want to support someone who that's their attitude is how little can I get away with that my customer won't know about so I can sell them something? Because I certainly don't. I want to support someone who says, I want to see how much I can possibly do for the client while still running a profitable business. And that's what's going on here. Okay, more water. Okay, side stiffeners. Side stiffeners, much like toe and heel stiffeners, are pieces of material that go in the sides of the shoe to support it. You don't typically see it at this price point. These don't have it, but it's totally fine. And sometimes you don't even want them because they do add to the insulation quality of the shoe, sweating, you know. And then the shank. So on these shoes, you'll notice there is this gap here, of course. This will collapse over time if all that exists is just the outsole. You need a stronger material to provide structural support in that arch. And so typically you have a shank, which is just a rectangular piece of material that extends from the heel to the midfoot. Typically you wanna see a steel shank, and that is exactly what you do have here. And in fact, on top of that, it's actually sandwiched in leatherboard, which not only allows for this beautiful sole bevel that we'll talk about later, but it also means that as your foot compresses down and molds to the inside of the shoe over time in that basin, you'll never encounter that steel shank because it has that leatherboard cushioning above it. Then we have the cork. So this shoe, because the shank takes up space in the heel and you already have the sock liner for cushion, this does not have cork in the heel. It has cork only in the mid and front foot. It's great, it's where you want it. It'll help provide that sort of molding and fitting to your foot over time that we all really love about quality leather shoes. And then lastly, the thread that holds this whole shoe together. It is blended, so it is part synthetic, part natural, pretty standard at this price point. And believe it or not, that is everything about the construction and materials. So now we're gonna move on to the design elements of the shoe. This is the fun part, as if this whole thing isn't just an absolute riot. We're going to go from top to bottom here. So we'll start with the last and the uppers, and then we'll move down along the side of the shoe to the outsole before we end with the shoe trees themselves. Now, I want to use this section to explain and elaborate on some of these design choices. However, at some points you may be wondering, why does high stitch density matter? Why do all these curves matter? Why do all these seemingly imperceivable details matter? Hold those thoughts. While this section is simply to introduce you to those design concepts, it is in the next section that you will actually be able to see how small, small differences in each of these little design elements can add up to form an entirely different shoe. Starting off, let's talk about the last of the shoe. The last is the model on which the shoe is actually made. It is the shape of the shoe. It is really the most important part, largely because the sole can be replaced, it can be refinished, the leather of the uppers can be refinished, but the last itself can really not be repaired. If it starts to fall apart, if you use bad shoe trees and it starts to warp, you really have to send it back to the factory, be entirely relasted. And sometimes at that point, you may as well just get another pair of shoes. And especially when we talk about these higher, higher end shoes, it's really why you're getting it. It's the design, it's the aesthetic, it's the artful sculptural quality to the shoe. Now this is the Van Gogh last, which is a newer last by TLB Mallorca. It has a soft chiseled toe. This tends to make for a little more of what you would call a contemporary shoe. It's a little more sleek, more angular. You know, I could talk, for a long time about the last design. And much of what I'd have to say, some people might call totally subjective. So I wanna bring a little more objectivity to that discussion by talking about three primary qualities, sort of hallmarks of quality last design that I like to look for when I'm assessing a shoe. The first thing is asymmetry. So you'll notice when you look at the shoe from straight on, you'll see there's a very aggressive asymmetrical curve down on the exterior of the foot. This is much like how your actual foot is shaped. A lot of people look at this sort of shoe and they think, God, that looks so uncomfortable, it looks tight, like I want more space. The example I always use is think about a suit, like what is the best fitting, most comfortable suit? It's not a baggy suit in which you have a lot of space to move around in, right? That's like not comfortable. It's also not a skin tight suit, but it's one that is fitted to you and in a way it's sort of an extension 
of your body. And so you want a shoe that's not tight against your foot, but also not loose for your foot. You want one that sort of is fitted to the way your foot is generally shaped. And that is why a quality shoe will always have that asymmetrical component to it. And on top of that, it reduces the amount of material in the shoe. If you have a bigger shoe that's very inflated, that's more leather that kind of moves around and rumples and wrinkles when you move, and it'll crease in ways that are just not particularly flattering. And this asymmetry leads to a really beautiful curve down the front of the shoe. And that leads to my second point, which is complex curvature overall. So a quality shoe, you usually want to see a lot of different curves going on to it. This curve coming down the instep, you have this curve on the interior of the shoe, the heel, you have these subtle small curves where the upper meets the last. That is a, first of all, it's just a beautiful sculptural quality, but it's also a sign of craftsmanship because that is not easy to do, right? It's far easier to just do a simple sort of half oval shape. Now the last more objective hallmark I look for in a last is the heel. When you look at a heel from the side, you want to see a curve on the rear. And sometimes this curve is more exaggerated. Sometimes it's a little more flat, but you want to see it consistent. You don't want to see it sort of curve up and then flatten out near the top. When you look at the heel directly from the back, you want to see really a large sort of bulbous shape near the bottom, which will reflect how your heel is actually shaped. You don't need that curve to extend all the way to the top. It's actually normal for it to flatten off. That's everything about the last and the final note I'll make is that this is all of it much better than you would expect at $400. There's a lot of complexity in the geometry going on here that you would not typically see at this price point. So that's the last. Now I wanna move on to the next design element, which is this little stitch here. This is called the stay stitch and I Never hear anyone talk about this. It's small, it's inconspicuous, you can hardly notice it, but it is visible on the shoe. For me, I really like looking at this small little stitch just to gauge the overall quality of the shoe because it's one of those things where if corners are going to be cut, they will be cut here. And I think the craftsmanship of this tiny little piece of thread can really reflect the attention to detail paid to the overall shoe. So you can see here, this is done very well. It's very tight to the vamp. It's just kissing the vamp perfectly. The point is, this is done really well. I'd say this is about as good as you would expect, if not maybe a little bit better at this price point. And then speaking of stitching, the next element I like to look at is just the overall stitch cleanliness. You know, there are so many different stitches binding this whole shoe together, which means there's so many opportunities for there to be a loose thread or the stitching to be a little wavy, a little off. Really in a high quality shoe, you want to see all that stitching perfectly consistent. You might sometimes see a few slip ups or a little bit of unevenness. And again, we'll see that in the comparison, but I have to say this shoe is pretty darn good. There's only a very, very tiny little bit of open thread. And we'll look at that in the imperfection section. But other than that, you know, you have a beautiful tight dual parallel stitch here on the vamp and toe cap. They're perfectly uniform. And even on the interior, the lining of the shoe where you again would expect corners to be cut if they're going to be cut, the stitching is all very clean and very tightly bound together. The next thing I wanna talk about is this stitch here. This stitch is a swan's neck. It's very beautiful. It adds again, a little bit more movement to the overall shoe. I wanna take a moment to speak about what is probably the most minute detail I will cover on this entire shoe. When we speak about design and we're assessing the design of products, people speak of a well-designed product as being aesthetically balanced. What does that mean? To give you an example, let's think of how we could make the shoe not balanced. If you took the heel and you literally just made it a square, uh, not only would that be not particularly useful, but you would say the shoe is not balanced because you have all of these curves going on up here and then this sharp squared angle on the back end. This would be heavy, and dense, and sharp, and this side would be light and smooth. Balance in a product is when you have different design qualities reflected in different areas of the product. So if you've roundness on one side, you want roundness on the other. And that is a simplistic example, but I bring it up to bring a little more objectivity into it. It's not just, I like this, I like that. We're looking for these specific moments of intentionality within the entire product. Back to the swan's neck, you'll notice this has a very harsh drop here into the vamp line. The degree of drop is almost exactly mirrored in the vamp 
in the swan's neck. It is a very, very sophisticated sign of aesthetic design to see this very subtle curve reflected here. When you have these products, part of the appreciation of them is sort of investigating them and peeling back these layers and seeing all these small details over time. It sort of brings you to that moment when that designer, when that person made that choice, it feels a lot like when you go to a ruin and you touch these stones and you sort of are transported to that moment that someone was carving this stone by hand centuries ago. Seeing these very, very minute qualities of design connects you with the craftsman, which I think is part of what makes these sort of items so special. Now, that may be exuberantly abstract, so, Let's switch gears to go to something that is absolutely not abstract, but in fact totally quantitative, which is the stitch density. Starting with the stitch density on the uppers, these have a stitch density of 14 stitches per inch. Around this price point, you typically see somewhere between eight and 12. So 14 is very impressive and it adds to the refinement of the shoe to have that very finely dotted line. And then on the welt, the stitch density for the sole stitch is eight stitches per inch, which again is very impressive. At this price point, you typically see four to six, and not just the density, but you can notice on the welt, this stitching is so tightly tucked into the upper, it's almost touching it. If you asked me how this was done, I would tell you it very well may have been done by hand because these machines cannot typically do that. Yes, they are machines, but they're not totally automated. It still takes a particular skill in both tuning and operating the machine to see that they've achieved such a fine level of both density and tightness on this stitch shows uh, an incredible craftsmanship. And again, goes back to this idea that part of why TLB Mallorca can do this is because they have their own factory. And then this welt is fudged, which refers to these indents here. And sometimes they can be very light and seem almost drawn on. These, you can tell, they're really deep imprints. And then another detail on the fudging I wanna point out, on a lot of shoes, you will see the fudging just sort of slowly fade off, and as is the case on the exterior. But on the interior of the shoe, you'll notice that it comes down to a very specifically tapered point. I love that. You know, when it fades off, that's okay, but it feels almost like an afterthought. It's like, okay, this is just sort of where the wheels stop making contact with the welt, but I far prefer this kind of gentle taper that to me just exudes finesse on the shoe. And then this welt is a 360 degree welt, which means it wraps all around the shoe. It has to meet itself at some point, the beginning and the end. This joint is another point of craftsmanship. Now this kind of joinery that you could call on the shoe is much like wooden joinery in that the highest quality will be the most flush and ideally invisible. So typically, you like to see that joint on the interior of the shoe and close to where the heel block meets the sole edge for it to be as tucked away and hidden as possible. This welt joint is here and it is visible, but the way I like to test this joinery is just with my fingernail, just see if you can catch it. And for this, you know, I can barely catch my fingernail on it, just barely, but as soon as I apply a little bit of pressure, it just pops off. So I have to say it's very well done. It certainly could be done a bit better, but I think it's perfectly standard and acceptable at this price point. And continuing the theme of joinery, we're gonna look at the welt and outsole joints. So of course the welt and outsole are attached here. They have a seam, the color is perfectly dyed, unless it's a stylistic choice that you have the outsole edge be very different color. You're always gonna want that to be the same. Now I can see the seam in the light, but if I try to catch my finger on it, the first thing to notice is I can't catch it going from the top down, but I can catch it just barely going from the top up. If I apply just a little bit of pressure, my fingernail pops off. But the more important thing there is that even though there's a little bit of overlap, it's from the top down, which you'd much prefer because if the outsole is overlapping, then it forms a ledge on which dust and debris can collect and become very noticeable. So if there's going to be any slight overlap, you want it to be the welt overlapping the outsole. And then the last joint is going to be on the heel stack. So let's look at the heel stack layers. It's even a little better than on the sole edge. Really can't even catch my fingernails at all. It's sanded perfectly flush, which is wonderful. It's dyed perfectly uniform. And then it also has this lovely wheeling here. This is simply a decorative wheeling to add just a little bit of an extra touch to what would otherwise be a rather plain surface. Now the heel layers are another point of craftsmanship. So 
These layers, typically, you don't wanna see them warping or wavy in any way. You wanna see them straight, evenly put, and that is exactly what you have here. And then notice the top edge of the heel stack. You'll see it has this very nice bevel here. It could just be a straight edge, but they've actually beveled it slightly to help give that impression that the upper is sort of lifted up off the heel and just give it a little bit of lightness. So that also, you, you don't see that really that often at all. And I think that is a lovely little touch. And then the last note on the heel block is just how tight it is to the heel. This is really what you want because again, aesthetically, this is the heaviest part of the shoe is just this heel stack. And so we have to think of how can we possibly balance that with everything else being so light, uh, both from a literal weight standpoint, but also from a design standpoint. And so the best way to do that is to tighten the heel as much as possible against the upper. You really want to see the upper extend out beyond the heel because if the heel extends beyond the upper, it almost always results in a shoe that is too heavy and unbalanced on the back end. And this is impressive. There are handmade shoes that do not have this level of tightness to the heel. So that, again, is a testament to the skill of the craftsmen who make these shoes. Now moving down to the sole of the shoe, this is where we get to the fun part. This is my favorite thing to look at on shoes, I think it's so great, specifically because it will disappear and that's what makes it so special. This is a standard leather sole. It has a lovely burnishing on it. This is the most important thing to point out, a closed channel sole. It just results in a much cleaner sole because you don't have that groove with the exposed stitching showing as you do on a normal open channel sole. But it's also important from a practical standpoint because the way they do this is they actually cut a small slit into the outsole, flip up a flap, do the stitching, and then glue that flap back down. So you actually have leather protection over that stitching, which means as you walk around and the shoe deteriorates, you're not immediately tearing up that thread that holds your shoe together. Now moving down the shoe, you can see this bevel on the sole. This comes from a tradition in bespoke shoemaking called the fiddle back, in which the waist of the sole is tapered up to a very sharp point, much like the back of a fiddle or a violin. And what I really like about that bevel is you have this beautiful curved sculpture on the top of the shoe and the bottom is just flat, which makes sense because it's the bottom of the shoe that you walk on, but just adding that little bevel there really balances out the whole geometry of the shoe. And again, it is a sign of craftsmanship. And this waist is also unusually narrow. This is a two and a quarter inch waist. And that is important not only because it makes for a beautiful silhouette on the bottom of the shoe, but it also allows for that beautiful curve on the interior of the upper, which adds to the overall complexity of the geometry. And then moving down to the top lift, you have these decorative brass nails here, which adds a little bit of finesse to what otherwise would be a rather plain part of the shoe. Now we've talked about the beveled sole. This is the beveled waist, where the straight sole edge becomes rounded on the waist. And it adds this wonderful circular quality to the shoe where you have this roundness of the upper reflected in the beveled waist, reflected in the beveled sole, and then wrapped up back around. That helps tie the whole thing together. And one more note on the beveled waist is that similar to the tapered edge of the welt fudging, this beveled waist actually transitions into the square sole edge by a very specific taper, which allows for this little edge that reflects light in this really beautiful way that, again, is just one of those small details of the craftsmanship of the shoe that you can really appreciate. The last note on design regarding the shoe itself is this little tab here. Typically, on the back of the shoe, this has to be finished somehow. You'll see traditionally a little sort of fishtail. TLB Mallorca here has done it with this tiny little tab, which I am absolutely in love with, and I think it demonstrates another principle of design, which is that good design may be functional, but you wouldn't necessarily think it is. It's very easy to make a beautiful shoe. It's also very easy to make a comfortable shoe. But to put those together into something balanced in the middle is where the skillmanship, the craftsmanship, the artistry is. If you ask me, does that serve a functional purpose? I would say I'm not entirely sure because it operates so well as just a nice little accent to the shoe. And for me, in general, I like subtle design. I like quiet details that are almost like 
hints or nods or Easter eggs in a product. And I think it's just a beautiful quality of the shoe. And then lastly, the shoe trees. You know, it's a good lasted shoe tree when it's kind of tricky to get out. TLB Mallorca offers lasted shoe trees. These are very beautiful. They have a nice finish to them. You have the standard hole here, which allows for the insole to breathe while the shoe trees are in. And they are just a beautiful wood. They're very nicely sanded to a semi-gloss. Lasted shoe trees are normally around $100. These are 65. I can talk all day, as you have witnessed, about how good a value these shoes are. But that doesn't show you whether or not these shoes are a good value. So let's look at what $400 typically gets you by comparing it to the ever popular and iconic Allen Edmonds Park Avenue, a Capto Oxford that retails for $395. This shoe is almost identical in both price and design and therefore makes for a perfect comparison. Can a century old American shoe juggernaut stand up against a small Spanish family company? Let's find out. And the way we will do that is to very simply and quickly review all of those design elements and see how they compare. Let's start with last design and those three primary qualities. So the first one is asymmetry. On the Allen Edmonds, it just seems more like a almost half oval shape. I mean, you don't have much of that asymmetry. The second is going to be complex curvature. You don't have that beautiful swooping down. The Allen Edmonds doesn't really have much. It has a soft curve on the interior. It doesn't have much of a curve where the uppers meet the welt. It just sort of falls flat. Now the Allen Edmonds does have a fairly soft curve here on the side profile. But when you look at the shoe from the rear, there's really no bulbous quality. It just sort of falls flat on the last with just a tiny bit of rounding at the very bottom. Then moving on to the stay stitch, you can see on the Allen Edmonds, it's not even close to the vamp and it seems like it's at a bit of an off angle. And you can actually already see here there's some loose threading just popping out of the shoe, which leads to the next element, which is just overall stitch cleanliness. Now on the Allen Edmonds, of course, immediately you have these couple loose threads, and then on the vamp stitch, it's a triple stitch, which already leads to kind of a heavier looking shoe. On top of that, the stitching on that parallel stitching is not uniform. The spacing of it kind of varies quite a bit. Moving around to the rear of the shoe, this stitch here on the heel, again, another loose stitch just sort of popping out. The vamp itself is not fully attached to the upper. You can see here, which means dust and debris can gather in that space. Even shoe care product can gather in there, which you don't want because it can oversaturate that bit of the leather and actually stain it. And then lastly, on the interior of the shoe, you can see how on the 198 Artista, the lining is very tightly tucked into the upper where it's stitched on. And the Allen Edmonds, it's just sort of hanging off, almost like a loose piece of fabric that's been torn. The swan's neck, of course the Allen Edmonds does not have a swan's neck, which itself is okay because that's a design choice, but typically when you don't have a swan's neck, you have a more beautiful sort of elegant, soft, simple curve. Here, it's just a kind of straight line that drops off pretty harshly. The stitch density on the uppers on the Allen Edmonds shoe is 10 stitches per inch versus 14 on TLB Mallorca. And again, you can really see how that affects the total aesthetic of the shoes, that finer stitching that kind of lifts the shoe. Similarly, the stitching on the welt, the sole stitching on the Allen Edmonds is only about four stitches per inch. It's notably further off the sole edge than the TLB Mallorca, which is tightly tucked underneath such that you can actually, from the top, you can see the stitching on the Allen Edmonds. And it wouldn't be so bad if the stitching didn't also look kind of clunky. I mean, again, you want the sole edge from the top down to highlight the upper, to highlight the last, it's sort of the star of the show and everything else should function as an accent. But on the Allen Edmonds where you can see that sloppy stitching, it distracts from the overall form of the shoe. And there's no welt fudging either, which again, you can see on TLB Mallorca how that fudging provides this very nice decorative outline, almost like the framing of a picture. And then looking at the welt joint on the Allen Edmonds, similar, 
to the TLB Mallorca, the welt joint is on the interior of the shoe, right around where the heel meets the sole edge. And to their credit, it is well done. It's relatively flush. And then doing the fingernail test on the edge, already two problems here. First, it's overlapping so dramatically on the Allen Edmonds that you can feel it just by rubbing your finger against it. And then you can completely catch, I mean, I can really push and my fingernail just digs right in where on the TLB Mallorca, if it catches and I push down, it just pops off. It's that shallow of an overlap. And even worse, that overlap is from the sole. So the sole is further out than the welt, which means it forms a ledge on which dust and debris can catch. And this edge here, I've dyed it myself, but if you buy a new Allen Edmonds Park Ave, you'll be able to see the sole edge compared to the welt. So the dye work isn't even really there at all compared to the TLB Mallorca, which is a perfect pitch black all around. And then on the heel stack, it's actually pretty good that it doesn't catch quite that bad on the heel stack on the Allen Edmonds. I can catch a little bit, but definitely much better than on the sole edge. And there's no wheeling, there's no decoration of any kind on the heel block here. It extends further out than the uppers. And this is a really good example because the Allen Edmonds shoe, even though it's already a kind of inflated, big, heavy model to begin with, that heel block being extended out really just holds the shoe down. And then the evenness of the layers you can see compared to TLB Mallorca, Allen Edmonds sort of has this wavy quality to the layers on the heel block and they're uneven in thickness. Moving down to the sole, I have actually dyed this. Uh, this comes in a lighter shade typically. Of course, I've worn this a few times so we can look past that. Allen Edmonds has this open channel here and you can immediately see the difference between an open and a closed channel sole. I've only worn these a few times and you can already see the stitching starting to fray and deteriorate, that important stitching that holds the whole shoe together. The waist width on the Allen Edmonds is a little over two and a half, it's about two and five eighths, and you can really see how that changes the whole silhouette of the bottom of the shoe. There's no bevel, it's a totally flat waist, and the top lift on the Allen Edmonds is just full rubber, there's no leather, there's no decorative nails. And then moving back up the shoe, you have no beveled waist, it's just a flat square waist here. And then going to the very back, you see this has this kind of fishtail I was describing earlier. That itself is okay, but more importantly, you can see the stitching here is just a bit off and it lacks the kind of refinement and quality execution that the 198 Artista has. And then the last note are lasted shoe trees. Now, to my knowledge, there are no lasted shoe trees for Allen Edmonds. You know, even if there was, I'm not sure it would be worth the money because there's not much of a last to preserve here. I mean, it's just a simple kind of half oval shape. And so I don't think you really need lasted shoe trees for this shoe. So I've talked much about how wonderful these shoes are, but they are not perfect. So let's look at some of those perfections. Let's look at some of the manufacturing defects, the design flaws with these shoes. Where do they fall short? First, I'm going to talk about manufacturing defects that both shoes share and then each shoe individually. And then I'll go on to talk a little bit about some design flaws. Both shoes came with some roughness on the sole. Now these are a little more rough than they came because of my handling but nonetheless, they came with some scuffs, some scratches. Ideally, perfect would just be an absolutely flawless surface on the bottom. And then on top of that, there were some flaws in the dye work. So you can notice right here, there's a little smidge where dye clearly got onto the sole when it shouldn't have. That's present on both shoes. And then moving down to the heel nails, the brass has this very lovely reflection when the light bounces off of it. But these have been, some of them are covered with well, it was probably the adhesive used to bind the heel stack together, and I can remove it with the awl, but it's just not ideal. Moving up to the heel, the heel has this beautiful bevel on the top of it that we spoke about, but it only exists halfway on the heel block because the other half of the heel block, that bevel sort of deteriorates, and on this shoe, it just softens off and rounds off. On this shoe over here, it kind of gets sort of gritty and rough, and I'm not sure if that is a user error or if that's something with the machine that it can't quite get that bevel all around. But ideally, you'd have that perfectly sharp bevel extending all around the heel block. And then individually on the shoes, the left shoe here has a bit of wonkiness on the sole stitching. So on the interior of the shoe, the stitching is actually more dense. It's nine stitches per inch 
here on the interior, and then it's eight on the exterior. Now, it's supposed to be eight, and it's better that it's nine than seven, but it is an inconsistency and therefore an imperfection with the shoe. On top of that, you can really see on the front of the shoe at the toe, there's a kind of wonkiness going on with the stitching. It just waves around a little bit. You'd rather have that line be perfectly clean as it goes around the shoe. And then on the interior of the shoe, you can see there is a little bit of dye error. It's not supposed to extend beyond the stitching of the lining, but it kind of bleeds down a little bit in this one little spot. And then there's that loose thread we spoke about earlier. You can see it's just a tiny little thread that pokes out here. And then moving on to the right shoe, this has a similar sort of wonkiness with the sole stitching. So on this one, it's nine stitches per inch on the exterior forefoot, and then it drops down to about eight in the back of the exterior forefoot. On the interior where the lining is stitched to the upper, the dye just sort of bleeds down a little bit into that stitching where it should be cleanly cut off by it. <sighs> so that's it as far as manufacturing defects. Let's move on, let's talk a little bit more about design critiques. The first is on the heel nails. So I talked about these before, talking about this idea of balance. If there's going to be brass heel nails in the bottom of the shoe, I would really like to see that reflected in some sort of metal up near the forefoot. Now, of course you could get toe taps for the shoe if you wanted to pay that bit extra, but if you didn't, I still feel like there should be some kind of metal nailing here, even if they were just subtle decorative nails, just one or two along the edge of the shoe. I think that would help balance out the overall aesthetic and materiality of the shoe. That I think is the least strong of the three criticisms I have, but I thought it was an interesting point to make. Next is the interior of the heel. You will typically see on higher end shoes, a suede portion, that little suede backing is meant to provide a greater grip on your heel so that you are less likely to slip around or blister in your shoe. It's odd that it doesn't exist on this shoe. I don't have a particularly exasperated complaint about it, but it just seems surprising in the sense that there are other qualities of this shoe that are punching so far higher than its price point and so far higher than having a suede counter that I'm sort of surprised it isn't in there. And then the last point I'd make, which I think I feel the strongest about, is the heel stack. So we've talked about how beautiful this shoe is, how complex the last is, how refined the stitching all is. This heel stack seems out of place. Now that it's so tightly cut to the heel, I think is why it works, but I'm surprised there's not a pitch on it. Often on higher end shoes, you will have a pitched heel. That is a heel with a taper on it where it comes slightly down at an angle. Because right now you have a shoe where there's a lot of different angles and dynamic moving lines. And then you have this heel stack, which is just sort of a straight right angle. If there's one thing that I think would make this whole shoe really tie together, it's just a slight pitch on the heel. There's really three points I wanna end on with this section. Number one is the reason I do this section is because I want to make sure you guys understand the product that you may get if you buy this shoe. I am not a salesman for these shoes. These are not perfect shoes. You can get perfect shoes. You will pay $5,000 and take a trip to England or Japan to get them. These are $400 and they ship for free. I am just here to inform and make sure you guys understand everything positive and negative about the shoe. And you know, when you buy the shoe, here is the margin of reasonable defect. The second reason I do it is because I think it's a really helpful learning opportunity. I want to share with you guys how I assess shoes, how I look at them in really fine detail. And so I think it's just a really nice chance to show you how I do that. And hopefully that's something you can carry forward when you're looking at shoes, whether they be TLB Mallorca or anything else. The third point I wanna make is do not lose the forest for the trees. When you are looking at these shoes or any other shoes, I enjoy this. I enjoy critiquing products. I like looking at the finer details of artful items and craft items, because when you look at those finer details and they're done well, it's a really exceptional moment. This fine tooth combing of the products should be done only within the consideration of price. A leather dress shoe for $250 may still be an exceptional value 
just as an exceptional value as this, even if it uses Celastic in its toe stiffener. It's different at that price point. So that is all of the imperfections and design flaws with the shoes. Now, Hello, it's me. I'm the advertisement. I consult. I consult on a private client basis. This is something I already do. I thought I'd extend it to all of you. You know, in my life, I've started a few companies. I've had some very nice successes. I've also had some awful dramatic failures, but I have learned a lot nonetheless through all those experiences. And I like to help other people who were perhaps in positions that I was earlier on avoid the mistakes that I made. So I consult. I currently have two companies. I have a real estate company that operates under Lib Sotheby's International Realty, providing luxury real estate services. I also have a media company, which does a variety of things, one of which being dress well. I'm very blessed to have learned a lot throughout these experiences and the people I consult with feel like they learn a lot too, which is wonderful. Here are the categories in which I typically consult, although I am open if you have something else in mind. Something I've already consulted with a few people about is media. So starting uh, what I refer to as new media, which is YouTube, Instagram, these things. Even though I'm not exactly Mr. Beast, there is a lot of information actually that I wish I knew when starting the channel. And so these are the kind of discussions that I've had with a few people so far. Something I will note is that all of the revenue from that does go directly back to the channel. So if you are interested in seeing more of the work I do here, of it improving, this is a great way to support that. Add over. So there's not much to say here. The website's pretty straightforward, easy to navigate. There are a couple points I had though. TLB Mallorca, they have it so that on the category page where you have all the product designs, you have all the different designs and the different colors they come in, which is odd because if you click on the actual design itself, you can still see the different colors that it comes in on the actual product page. You know, you go to the online style, for example, and you see it and immediately it's like, oh, there's eight designs, let me compare all of them. And then it turns out, oh, there's actually three designs, but it just shows all the different colors they're offered in. Even more frustrating, they're not even in order. I feel like it's much more intuitive to just have the designs on one page so you can easily visually compare them. And then when you identify one you want to click on it and then see what colors it's offered in. But that may just be me. Is it the end of the world? Like. Well, it is for me because I live in a very fragile world and it is blown to bits by the slightest gentle breeze. But it shouldn't be for you because objectively, it's just not that big a deal. Anyways, that's the first point. Second point I wanna make are the, the guides. They have these guides here, which I love to see. These companies, shoemakers, sock makers, they are the authorities on the subject. They're the best people to educate the consumer on their product and so I think it's a lost opportunity when many of them don't. Some web pages will have this and it's kind of superficial information. Some will have almost an encyclopedic level of knowledge like Pantherella. I'm not even like a huge fan of Pantherella. I mean, they have great socks. They're a little expensive though. But what I do appreciate about them is they have really, really deep knowledge on their website. I mean, really important information that you wouldn't find elsewhere about construction quality and design for high quality dress socks. TLB Myrka's website is somewhere in the middle. It's not like super encyclopedic knowledge, but it's also not superficial. Like it's pretty interesting. I mean, I, I've read through all of it and I actually found it really interesting reading through the whole soul guide and the, all the different souls that they have. There's some I didn't know, like I never heard of a sommelier soul. I don't know if that's just something they have or if that's actually a thing outside of their company. So again, you know, this isn't the most compelling part of the video, but I think it's something that I appreciate. So I wanted to share that with you guys. But while we're on the website, let's talk about the different products that TLB Myrica offers. So very quick, they have shoe care products. It's just kind of a small assortment of Saphir products. You know, Saphir's great, I use Saphir. They have shoe trees, of course, we've discussed those. And then interestingly, they have belts, which my understanding goes back to the roots of the company because Tony actually started off making belts and I think other leather accessories as well. So they do belts. I don't have any of their belts, so I can't really comment on their quality, though, you know, if I was in the market for a belt, I'd shop around, but they'd probably be on the list. 
And then just the variety of footwear they have. There are bigger companies with less selection. You know, TLB Mallorca isn't exactly like a tiny company, you know, but they're not big. The selection they have of different designs and styles and products is just kind of unreasonable. Kind of like everything going on with this brand, it's just sort of unreasonable. They've got these unlined loafers, they've got these Kiowa loafers, they've got Shell Cordovan, they've got all these different derbies and monk straps, derby boots, like, and then they just have some creative and weird designs, right? Like this 218 Artista, which has piped seams. It's just like, I can't imagine they'd sell a ton of that, but I think it's cool that they offer it anyways. Something I'll add on that is I don't have 20 different TLB Mallorca shoes to show you guys, but if you do want to see these shoes kind of more in action, more modeled in action and with different outfits, uh, an Instagram page that I would suggest you check out is at outbespoken. This guy is awesome. This guy is like a god, like his, this guy's level of godliness is like close to Phil Swift from Flex Tape. Like that's how legendary this man is. He's just got, he's got great style. Almost everything he wears for footwear is TLB Mallorca. He has a bunch of different shoes from them. So if you want to see more of how these shoes look, I'd suggest going to his page. He's got really great work. So we've got a ton of variety. And then the last thing I wanna talk about is their custom program. They have this whole program set up where you can just basically put together every visible component of the shoe to your own liking. Different leathers, different colors. It's a cool program if you really wanna to customize to the nth degree. I think it's a very specific person who would use that program. I'm not sure I would even use it, but for the people who do, it exists. And I think that's a common theme among a lot of their products and designs is they offer a lot of the stuff that I think very few people would be interested in and therefore it probably doesn't make a lot of sense to even bother offering it. But that they do, I think shows a care for those people. I think that's cool. I think it's just like, it feels like they're, it feels like they're having fun with it. You know, which is something that you always like to see in someone who makes stuff, whether it's software, whether it's shoes. It's like you like to see people who really enjoy what they do and enjoy being creative and, and trying to offer new things and improve and like they're excited by what they do. And that's cool to me, you know? I mean, that's, that's really cool. So uh, that is that. Now let me talk about the client service experience. So obviously, I can't speak to what the client service experience would be for you guys because my relationship with them is professional. What I can tell you is that from everything I've seen, people seem to have a really good experience with the owner. It seems like the owner, Tony, still actually corresponds directly with a lot of clients, which is always a good sign. Even though I'm not a client to them in the same way you guys are, I do still have interactions with them behind the scenes in our emails and our engagements. And I have to say, you know, my interactions with them have been all really pleasant. They seem like really pleasant people. I actually met Tony at the Super Trunk Show as kind of a, a trade show in Manhattan just a couple weeks ago. Really friendly guy, seemed really passionate about what he does. You know, it was a, a brief interaction. Now, does that really matter to you? Should it matter to you? I don't know, maybe, maybe not. I mean, I just wanted to share it because it was my experience. It's at least like a tangentially relevant data point. Anyways. Uh, what's next?